Welcome to Future Squared, the podcast all about corporate innovation and entrepreneurship. My name is Steve Glaveski and each week I'll bring you authors, corporate innovation managers, entrepreneurs and above all else, thought leaders on the topics of innovation, entrepreneurship and self-improvement. Future Squared brings you a double dose of innovation inspiration every week to help you successfully navigate your innovation journey. Every Monday, I'll bring you a world-class thought leader such as Steve Blank, Alex Osterwalder, Neil Patel, Rand Fishkin, or Whitney Johnson, just to name a few. While every Friday, I'll bring you some quick digestible insights myself to help end your week on a high before you head off for the weekend. Future Squared is proudly brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation hub, school, and consultancy that works with large organizations to help them adopt the mindset, methodologies, and tools required to explore new business models and disruptive innovation in an era of rapid change. If your organization needs support coming up with ideas, testing and turning those ideas into reality, incubating teams, driving cultural change, or connecting and partnering with startups, then visit Collective Campus online at www.collectivecamp.us. And without further ado, here's today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Squared. Today I'll be speaking with Matthew E. May. He's the author of Winning the Brain Game, Fixing the Seven Fatal Flaws of Thinking, as well as four previous award-winning books, including The Laws of Subtraction, The Shibumi Strategy, In Pursuit of Elegance, and The Elegant Solution. A popular speaker, executive coach, and close advisor on strategy innovation and lean to companies such as ADP, Edmonds, Intuit, and Toyota, his articles have appeared in national publications such as the New York Times, Harvard Business Review, 99U, The Rutman Magazine, Fast Company, MIT Sloan Management Review, USA Today, Strategy in Business, and Quality Progress. He's appeared in the Wall Street Journal and on National Public Radio as well. A published songwriter, Matt considers winning the New Yorker Magazine Cartoon Caption Contest among his most creative achievements. So with that, it gives me much pleasure to bring you the one, the only, Matthew E. May. Welcome to the show, Matthew. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the program. So you're joining us all the way from sunny West Lakes Village in Los Angeles, California? Yep, yep, yep. Fantastic. And I see you're a stand-up paddle boarding man. Is that something you are partaking in the area there? Or? It is. I, li- I live by a lake, and uh, my wife and I love to do uh, stand-up paddle boarding. When we get a chance, we do it out, uh, out on the Pacific. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I actually tried it for the first time this past summer, and it's definitely one of those things I find that looks a lot easier than what it is, and it requires some serious, you know, concentration, stability, core strength. So, a lot of fun, though, nonetheless. Exactly why we did it for the core strength. Yeah, fantastic. So, um, look, today I wanted to talk to you, uh, Matthew, about winning the brain game. Um, obviously, congratulations are in order. You recently released this book, and it's received. Critical acclaim from the likes of Guy Kawasaki, Carol Roth, Marshall Goldsmith, and numerous others. So, yeah, congrats first up. Well, thank you, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm pretty proud of this little book. Mm, No, so you should be. And, you know, I've had a chance to um, not necessarily look through the entire book, but I have... Um, delved into the the concepts you've brought forward, and it's something that I obviously want to touch on today. So, you know, the book builds on 10 years and hundreds of interactive creative sessions in which you gave more than 100,000 professionals a thought challenge based on a real case far less complex than their everyday problems. Um, And what you found was not only did less than 5% arrive at the best and most elegant solution, but the solutions given were remarkably similar, revealing seven observable problem-solving flaws that can block our best thinking. And so you've explored these different flaws in the book, and you've come up with a range of different mindful thinking tools which can help to address these flaws. So I'm really keen to explore um, the seven flaws today um, because I think there's a lot of relevance here for our audience, and they could uh, derive a lot of value by talking through some of the case studies um, you've uncovered. So um, first up, I guess I wanted to touch on you know, flaw number one, which is leaping to conclusions. And, um, you know, we basically, I mean, this podcast is all about corporate innovation and entrepreneurship and, you know, average startup failure rates hover at about 90 to 95% um, because founders often go straight from light bulb moment to full scale build and marketing without thinking too much about validating that customer appetite. And the same goes for a lot of new ventures in large organizations. So um, can you talk to us a little bit more about leaping to conclusions? Sure. It is uh, definitely the most prevalent of these seven behavioral patterns that I I recognized over the years. Mm -hmm. Uh, When I would give 
uh, a problem to a team to work on. Um, they couldn't help themselves but to launch right into good old-fashioned brainstorming. Yep. Uh, and there's probably good reason for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and the reason is not necessarily that we come into the world wired to do that, because if you look at children, um, they're far more curious, experimental, uh, willing to try new and different things. And, and certainly by the time they're able to talk, uh, they love to ask the question, why, 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 yes. why? Yeah. Um, but once we get into the school and, and school system, um, gosh, all of a sudden we're not asking the questions anymore. Uh, our teachers are, and mm. they want an answer. They want the right answer. They want it very quickly, often in a timed format. Mm-hmm. And as we grow up in the school system, the the, the time constraints to get the right answer um, become even more onerous. We have to be faster. We have to be uh, smarter. Um, and we sort of lose the ability uh, to stop and and ask the question of the question. Is this the right question in the first place? And, you know, gosh, how, how dare we as students and then later as employees uh, of our bosses or supervisors, how dare we question the assignment? Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we generally lose that ability. And so we, by the time we're in the workforce, gosh, uh, it's second nature for us to just leap right to a solution. Um, the other thing is that, that by, you know, by the time we were awake for an hour every day, we have probably solved 50 or 60 sort of surface quick uh, problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are we going to wear? Where do we need to be? Uh, who's trying to get me? We don't, don't need to think deeply about that. We just need a very quick uh, workaround solution to a routine problem. And the, the trouble is that that natural, by, by now, sort of natural instinct to get to an answer very quickly um, doesn't work so well when we're given a problem that's a little bit unfamiliar, mm-hmm. a little bit uncertain. We don't have a ready solution, uh, and it requires deeper thinking. It just generally doesn't work. But that's the leaping flaw. Um, you know, by the time we're adults, we're just masters at leaping to conclusions, jumping to conclusions. Yeah, and I can definitely relate to the problem of. Uh Having to decide what to wear in the morning. I think I got changed three times this morning, but that's another issue. Um, but yeah, no, I think you're definitely, um, you know, couldn't agree more. I mean, what we often see in brainstorming sessions is that groupthink comes together. Um, and people, I guess, and this kind of ties into a few of the other flaws you've identified, but people don't want to look silly. Um, and therefore they say things that may seem safe, but they won't take risks that are likely to get rejected. Um, and because you're in that time box environment, you feel like you need to say something. I mean, that's what you're there for. And therefore people just say stuff and then jump to conclusions. Um, but I think, um, there's a lot of research out there to show this, that creativity, um, often comes from a place of, of flow. It's not like, okay, you're going to, you know, go into this room with 20 other professionals and within the next one hour, you're going to come up with the next game-changing idea. I mean, true creativity and innovation rarely works out that way. Correct, correct. And, you know, all the research is pretty clear that unfocused brainstorming uh, just really is not creative. You toss out uh, all of the top-of-mind solutions, and generally speaking, by the 15- or 20-minute mark, Mm. all of those ideas are out on the table. And then what happens is um, because you're not trained to sort of hold the creative tension and let your brain seep in the problem mm-hmm. um, and let it let it work its own magic uh, over time, uh, what happens is you select one of those suboptimal solutions and you mm-hmm. run with it. And lo and behold, you wake up uh, down the road somewhere and gosh, it didn't work. As a matter of fact, it may have made things worse. Yeah. And that kind of ties into um, floor number four, which is all about satisfying, um, settling on solutions that are easy, obvious, but mediocre and thus fail to solve our problems. Yes, it does. Um, you know, we uh, coming up with a new idea isn't easy. Our brains are by and large lazy. They don't like to expend a lot of resources. Mm-hmm. We are hardwired to to conserve our resources, especially our mental uh, resources. And so when it we see a solution or a pathway uh, to get us near where we want to be will satisfy us, which is, it's not my word. uh, It's a 50 or 60 year old word comes from a gentleman by the name of Herbert Simon, who wrote a book in 1957 Mm -hmm. called models of man, which was all about how we make decisions, which is 
get me to the good enough decision and then I'll just use my sheer willpower, my energy to push it forward. And we tend to trend toward uh, mediocrity mm-hmm. that way. And, and there's a place uh, for mediocrity, quite honestly. And you mentioned at the top of our discussion, um, entrepreneurs uh, and, and innovators in the startup uh, uh, environment. And it's okay to be mediocre when you are testing out a number of initial ideas. Yes. In fact, you don't want to be perfect. Uh, you don't want to spend a lot of time mm-hmm. and money and capital on a perfect solution that no one eventually really wants. Yes. You do want to be able to test out something that is quite satisfactory. But when you are uh, finalizing a product or service and you're trying to win in a given market space or trying to unseat the winner uh, of, of a certain, uh, I don't know, vertical or, mm-hmm. or playing field that you're trying to uh, be a leader at, boy, uh, a mediocre solution will just relegate you to an also ran status, and that's not where you want to be because the leader will always, always use their resources to beat you up. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more on that, and I think that's something that a lot of Product uh, managers in large organizations seem to struggle to get their head around the fact that, yes, you can use um, tools like, say, the Lean Startup um, and rapid prototyping early on to, you know, test lots of different assumptions. Um, they don't, it doesn't need to be pretty. You don't need all the bells and whistles. Um, the purpose of that is to essentially find that product market fit, find out what the market wants, find out what business model works. But once you kind of hone in on that, then you better ramp up and, you know, make sure it looks awesome. It works properly. It doesn't break down. It's, you know, it's, it's ready to, to scale. Um, and I think that kind of, Touches on a couple of your the flaws you've identified. Obviously, leaping to conclusions, not putting out mediocre um, solutions is one thing, but also um, overthinking things. Um, number three, where, you, where you've talked about um, people's tendency to overthink things, which I think also creates other problems. For example, 70% of government IT projects globally uh, fail. Um, and oftentimes this is because they become overly complex, people are afraid to make mistakes, and ultimately they overcommit to building the wrong thing. Um, so I guess there's not enough of that Pareto principle, 80-20 thinking, focusing on what problem you're really solving um, for an early adopter or for your target end user, and instead saying, oh, we need to roll out all the bells and whistles because we can't possibly release anything that isn't a nice shiny diamond. Yeah, what happens is then you get then you ship nothing um, mm. because there is no such thing as perfection. Yeah. Um, there just isn't. There's always, um, there's always something that can be improved upon, um, which is the whole notion of continuous innovation, continuous improvement. But yeah, overthinking is when we create problems that weren't even there to begin with. Mm-hmm. And I think your example of, of governments um, is good because governments, um, by and large, love to regulate. Mm-hmm. And when we see something that looks initially to be out of control, what we love to do is to rush in and regulate it and control it. When uh, oftentimes, if we were to simply observe the, the, com- the simplicity and the elegance of the solution may arise simply out of nature. Let me give you an example. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you talk about governments, how about urban planning? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you have uh, where you are shared spaces or not, but one of the things that I learned about about 10 years ago over in, uh, in Europe, in, um, in Holland of all places, was the notion of shared spaces, mm-hmm. which was to take a heavily trafficked intersection and remove all of the traffic controls, all the signs, all the lights, all the lines. Um, and when I say high traffic, I mean you know, upwards of 20,000 uh, vehicles, uh, whether they be trolleys or carts or buses uh, or cars or bicycles, mm-hmm. lorries, pedestrians. And what they began to do was to design those intersections in such a way that the traffic controls were removed, which required people to think and interact with each other. And lo and behold, if they did it in an artful way that isn't regulated, but they put natural artifacts in the way. For example, they would put uh, trees where mm-hmm. you think you should drive and sidewalk yep. cafe seating where you think you should be walking and driving. Um, and they took all the, the certainty out of it. We had to think. We had to look at each other. And the results were phenomenal. Um, it's, they, they, they're now in, in metropolitan areas like London, but traffic accidents went down 
oftentimes to zero because now you're thinking, now you're reacting, you're not relying on lights and signs to, to make all the decisions. And traffic flow was doubled. Mm. And, and, you know, the, that most annoying thing that where you come to a, a stop sign or a stop light and there's no other traffic around and you have to stay there until the light changes, it's quite annoying. Mm. All of that went away. It wasn't fast flow, but it never stopped. Um, so that's the notion of, of sometimes we overthink things, and traffic signals and traffic controls are a good example of that. Yeah, and I guess on leaping um, to conclusions, you've touched on a number of different potential solutions um, where you talk about asking questions, not, uh, not get providing answers. Can you elaborate a little bit on that, Matthew? Well, yeah, because I, my day job really is working with, uh, with teams to track down solutions to problems. Mm -hmm. um, basically, problem-solving facilitator is, is the hat that I normally wear. And I learned a long time ago that trying to get people to slow down and think deeply, you know, adopt the good old Rodin thinker, you mm -hmm. know, uh, chin and fist uh, <laughs> Dance just wouldn't work, especially not in the fast-paced world of business yeah. that we're in. So, but what we what you do want to do is think about something from different perspectives and think differently. And what I learned to do was what I call frame storming, which is very much brainstorming, except mm -hmm. that you're not brainstorming solutions or answers. What you're doing is storming questions. Uh -huh. You're you're taking an initial question or initial challenge or a, an initial problem. And you are reframing it in a variety of ways. And it can be done very quickly, but it begins with words like why or what if or mm -hmm. how might we. And you throw out many, many, many uh, questions like that. And then you pick the ones that seem to be um, present such a unique angle of looking at the challenge that you may not have thought of that in the first place. And that's where you begin your brainstorming of ideas and concepts and solutions. And it works wonderfully well because we don't like to feel like we're slowing down. We're comfortable with brainstorming. So the process is familiar. It's just the output is slightly different. And it's really a wonderful way to defeat leaping. Mm, yeah. And I, I think, uh, you know, this concept of asking questions is also pretty uh, synonymous with, you know, human-centered design, and which is all about, you know, deep customer empathy. Um, and if we're not prepared to ask the right questions, then the solution is coming from a place of ego rather than, you know, ecosystem, I guess. Yeah, designers are wonderful at uh, framing problems differently. Um, and most of the, the kinds of solutions or disruptive innovations that we love to tell stories about these days, uh, whether they're the, the Airbnbs or the, the Ubers of the world, uh, they basically take a different often opposite uh, view of, of a problem. Uh, and designers are just really great at saying, well, what's the problem we're really trying to solve here? And is there a different way of looking at it? Because there's always a different perspective you can take. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And I guess on that different perspective, um, I'm reminded of Apple's famous slogan, which was, think different. Um, which is all about getting away from deeply entrenched thinking patterns. And this ties into um, one of the other flaws you've identified, which is all about fixation. Um, and as we know, thanks to you know, neuroplasticity, the brain has an ability to create new neural pathways and tune itself to changing needs. Um, so we can always change um, in response to the changing environment um, with a little bit of conscious effort. So, I mean, what, I, what thoughts do you have or what can you tell me about fixation, um, what sort of case studies did you uncover in this space, and what can people do to kind of tune themselves a different way, so to speak? Well, yeah, sure. Fixation is simply my word for uh, what psychologists uh, refer to as functional fixedness. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of famous problems that uh, psychologists have been studying for, gosh, 70, 80 years. The good old candle, the, the uh, Dunker candle problem is a famous one, but there are others. Um, and really it's that our brains are quite good at making patterns, keeping patterns, 
based on all of our experiences, whether they're visual, whether they're auditory, whether they're um, you know physical in nature. Uh, when we get a little bit of information and we get a little bit more of information, our brain loves to make a pattern. And what happens is we get locked into that. And so I got to spend some time with um, a neuroscientist here in Southern California who deals with perhaps one of the most debilitating brain disorders uh, in the world, and it is it, it's fixation on steroids, which is OCD, um, obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, what he does is not to use pharmaceuticals in any way, drugs in any way. He trains people to reframe how they're viewing and thinking about a given situation. He teaches people to uh, label, relabel the messages that they're getting, you know, in their brain as mm -hmm. deceptive and faulty. Um, he he teaches them to reframe the problem and replace their actions and behaviors with a different behavior. And lo and behold, their brain actually gets rewired physically. Yeah. The gray matter, the neurochemical um, transmitters, flow differently. The connections are different. And um, gosh, you know, not all of us suffer from OCD, thankfully, but <laughs> we actually kind of suffer from a mild form of it, which is we get stuck in these ruts. And one of the, the tricks, I can call it a trick, I guess, uh, that I use in my sessions mm -hmm. is, uh, op is opposite day. It's, it's a form of inversion, which is just inverting the, inverting the normal course, the normal um, aspects of a given situation and completely reversing them. Mm -hmm. Sort of like the, the, you know, the examples I just gave a, a bit ago, um, Airbnb and Uber. Well, gosh, Airbnb is um, it's like a hotel operator with no, no hotels. Yep. Uh, Uber is like a, a taxi operator with, with no fleet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so opposite day is just is whatever problem you're looking at. List the five to seven traditional or conventional characteristics or traits of the situation and then just reverse them. Uh, play opposite day, and you'll come up with a list of completely opposite ways to think about the problem, and they're great launching points uh, for new ideas. So um, fixation can be solved and fixed by inverting things mm. uh, and playing opposite day. And opposite day comes from, a, from an old television show called Seinfeld, which we don't need to get into now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we could talk about Seinfeld all day. Um, but um, no, that's, that's a great point because I recently basically set myself a target of going 20 days without judging or complaining. Um, so each time I caught myself, say, complaining, I would notice that. And like you said, what's the opposite? And I would respond to it with a positive. For example, oh, the train's five minutes late. You know, small things like that, which really don't matter in the greater scheme of things, but people tend to get a little bit annoyed. And I just figured, well, that's, that's fine. It's an extra five minutes late. It's an extra five minutes I get to read this book. Um, so, or maybe it is, okay, maybe I should be more conscientious of checking the, you know, train app and, and getting there on, on time. And, you know, if there are delays, being conscious of that and planning my day better. So there's always a negative that you can turn into a positive. Um, and I think after those 20 days, I found myself um, complaining way less and being a lot more content with moments that would normally frustrate me. And I, in fact, I guess the idea of complaining about such moments became somewhat foreign after a while as I began associating what I had originally perceived as negative events with positive sort of growth opportunities. So um, it's quite interesting and quite powerful how if you consciously try and play opposites, um, the effect it can have after, I guess, you know, well, there's a lot of conventional wisdom out there that says if you do something for 21 days in a row, it will begin to form a habit. Whether or not that's true or not, I guess, depends on what you're doing. But I definitely agree wholeheartedly with this whole um, playing opposites um, concept. Well, what you've just alluded to actually um, brings to mind basically what you accomplished in that 20 days uh, was becoming more mindful. Mm. Um, which is you began to notice uh, things. You were in the present more. You yes. didn't uh, allow pa the past to color the, the present. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you became a more mindful person because mindfulness really is the opposite of mindlessness. Mm -hmm. So rather than getting mad automatically because the train is late, you simply noticed it for what it was, mm -hmm. and then you stumbled on uh, the fix for what I call self-censoring, which is killing your own ideas, which is sort of the epitome of mindlessness. Yeah. You stumbled on the technique for, for fixing it, which is here's this situation that's causing me stress. 
Um, and what you did was to say, well, here's this situation um, that shouldn't be causing me stress. And the reason it shouldn't be causing me stress is because actually there's some good stuff that could happen mm -hmm. from this situation. And you've, you moved completely from a mindless state to a mindful state. Um, and, and that's a wonderful thing. Oh yeah. Couldn't agree more. And you know, you've, you've touched on, uh, well, you touched on it there with self-censoring, which is, um, Floor number seven in your book, self-centering to avoid rejection. And I guess, you know, as human beings, uh, physiologically, we all share the amygdala in the brain, which I believe has the ability to catch on to negative emotions and disturbing events in the environment about 15 times quicker than we ourselves actually become aware of them. Um, and it often causes us to respond with that impulse instead of reason and to be mindless as opposed to mindful. Um, and I guess it's, it also drives part of that innate uh, fear culture that we have. You know, when certain events happen, we don't want to look stupid, we don't want to make mistakes, we don't want to be rejected, and because of the amygdala, because of this whole innate fear culture that we have, um, we often censor ourselves and limit our opportunities to learn and grow. Which to me is the, the deadliest of the fatal flaws because essentially what you are doing is um, almost voluntarily shutting down your own creative power mm -hmm. um, and it, you know it, it it's the difference between an adult and being a, a child in the in the sandbox um, they are not censored they're they're free to go where their imagination takes them um, not worried about what anyone else thinks um, and then you know then they happen to fall down on the cement while they're running too fast and the next time they're a little bit more careful because mm. uh, they don't want to feel that that hurt. Uh, yeah. They touch a red hot stove and gosh, you know, I don't yeah. like that feeling. Or they get, they get ridiculed by uh, their peers, um, you know, when they're in grade school and gosh, that didn't feel good. So uh, I'm going to avoid that. Or the teacher says, wow, that's, that's not the right solution. And the kids laugh and we learn not to speak up anymore. And it's mm. a, it's a tragedy, but it is quite honestly, it's, it's mindless. So how do we go from mindless to mindful? And that's why I think you see right now a lot of uh, corporate programs focused on mindfulness, mm -hmm. coming at it from the standpoint of, of meditation, which is a wonderful tool for many people. It doesn't happen to work for me. I, I'm more of the kind of person who would do something like you did, which is um, stop, take a look at the assumptions that I'm working under, mm -hmm. Think about an opposite way of, of looking at them, and all of a sudden, stress gets reduced because now it's not necessarily a bad thing. Mm. And even if it is a thing that happens, there's good stuff and there's bad stuff that's going to happen from it. Um, and I'm, I'm unless you know at stress than I was before, which is the ultimate goal of, of meditation. I think many times is to is to quiet the mind and relieve stress. So yeah. there are a number of ways to approach mindfulness. Um, uh, so anyway, I like, I like your approach. Works for me as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do dabble in a little bit of mindfulness meditation, but what I find with that is it's more of a clear your head at the end of a day or at the start of your day kind of thing. What I find is way more effective for me at least is you know what we've just been speaking about where you notice things throughout the day and you put some distance between those initial impulse thoughts and yourself and, and respond from a place of reason. And I think over time you train yourself to just think clearer and and respond um you know with better decisions throughout throughout your day and i think um you know i had this conversation with dave gray who wrote a book called game storming and the connected company uh last week um and we were talking about how you know he's also put together something called the culture map which is about how large organizations can start to change the culture to one which is all about getting out of a fear fear based mindset and one towards um embracing risk embracing small failures as a mechanism to learn and you know he he kind of agreed that culture change begins with being self aware um and he great, gave a great example of a manager who whenever someone came bearing bad news, he would essentially shoot the messenger and get really angry. And eventually, lo and behold, he stopped hearing bad news. Uh, but it wasn't for the right reasons. Yeah, and what you're talking about, um, and what, what Dave is talking about too, is um, you, know, you mentioned it briefly there, which is distancing yourself um, and being more objective mm -hmm. um, and being aware of the details. It's like when you travel to a new place. Um, and psychologists have to actually call it self-distancing. Um, you know, when you travel to a place that you've never been before, uh, you are you are far more attuned to the details around you, things mm. that 
uh, those that live there that are natives to that part of the world, to that city, to that land, they take for granted. Yeah. Uh, but you don't. You notice all of those details. You notice how different they are from the way things are where you live. And if something goes wrong uh, when you're you know, traveling that way, and you, you tend to laugh at yourself and in the, in the folly of, of doing something, whereas if you were a native of that land, you might get mad at yourself for being so stupid, mm. um, you know, that, and you just weren't thinking and, oh my gosh. Um, but, you know, when you distance yourself uh, in that way, as if you were traveling to a different place, um, all of that emotional baggage sort of leaves you. You look at things far more objectively. Um, and this is why I think, you know, it's, it seems to be easier to solve other people's problems than our own. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you ever had that where, where someone gives you a problem oh, and, yeah. and they're, they're struggling with it, they can't figure it out, but it's clear as day to you mm-hmm. what, what they should do. Um, and that's really part of being mindful is how do you distance yourself from yourself so that you can advise yourself as an objective outsider would do. Yeah, and I think that applies for um, whether it's a startup advisor. It's a lot easier to give advice to someone else than to build it yourself or relationship advice. You know, a friend struggling with, you know, a partner who is perhaps not treating them the best. And, you know, from your perspective, it's quite black and white what they should do. But when there's all that emotion involved and they're not thinking from a place of mindfulness, um, you know, their decisions obviously don't align with what you would do um, looking from the, well, from the outside looking in. Um, so that's a great, great observation. Um, quickly, Matthew, I wanted to touch on one of the other flaws, which I think is really important, which is um, this concept of not invented here. Um, and, you know, I've worked with and observed many organizations who feel that they need to reinvent the wheel um, when a solution already exists. Obviously, this wastes time, money, comes with an opportunity cost, and can also hurt employee morale, um, especially of the more progressive employees who want to change, um, or who want to drive change. Um, so why, why do you think uh, this actually happens? I mean, what, is, is this just a throwback to our tendency to, as leaders and managers, you know, be expected to have all the answers and not want to um, look vulnerable by... Um, you know, asking others for help or commissioning solutions that already exist? Well, you know, I think that's part of it. I think that's part of it. Um, But there's another part of it that actually has to do with a a bit of neuroscience and Mm -hmm. and a little bit of biology. Um, It actually requires more of our mental resources to process and assimilate the ideas of others. Mm -hmm. And because we... Don't and at the same time we don't get the same bit of adrenaline-like rush from adopting others' ideas as we do when we uh, have our own little aha moment. Yeah. So at once it's it's harder to mentally process ideas of others and it's not as rewarding. So we tend to naturally um, reject things that are uncomfortable and there's no payoff for. Mm-hmm. Um, but gosh. Yeah, um, uh, the the flip side of that is, boy, if, if Steve Jobs had had that um, that attitude, that non invented here, which, mm. which basically means if we didn't come up with the idea, it's not a good one. Yep. If he had had that attitude um, when he went to visit uh, Xerox, yep. uh, Palo Alto Research Center in the late 70s, we might not be uh, using an iPhone today, quite honestly, mm. or a Mac computer today. Um, he quite actually he was fairly proud of the fact that he stole. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> what he considered to be the the future of com- computer, and and John and John Ives too. Um, you know, a, a quick Google of of, of Apple design compared to uh, Braun uh, design mm. um, is kind of eerie. Um, and and Johnny Ives uh, was quite proud of the fact that he you know stole uh, design concepts from from Dieter Rams um, of Braun fame. So. Um, it's it's interesting. So perhaps I don't know. Johnny Ives and Steve Jobs were neuroscientists. I don't know. Maybe they <laughs> knew something no one else knew, which was uh, no one else is going to take on these ideas because it's harder to take mm. on other people's ideas, and you don't get the payoff. Yeah. Um, so that's part of it too. And 
But from a business perspective, Procter and Gamble recognized that um, as well as Steve Jobs and A.G. Laffley at Procter and Gamble uh, about a decade and a half ago said, you know, our ROI on innovation is is just horrible. Mm. And he mandated 50 percent of all of their innovation had to come from the outside. So all of a sudden you've opened up your radar screen and it's the whole notion of being more mindful in a business sense, right? You're looking at different, um, different ideas, opening yourself to the, the perspectives, uh, and the viewpoints and the ideas and solutions of others on purpose. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, it, it really made uh, all the difference in the world to, uh, to Procter and Gamble. So much of my job these days is working with companies to do exactly that, uh, is to work on an outside innovation network um, so that you do uh, avoid reinventing the wheel and yep. you're more like the, 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 you adopt the Sid Caesar quote, the old Sid Caesar quote, if I'm not impressed with the guy who invented the wheel, I'm really impressed with the guy who came up with the other three. Yeah, well, that's a great, great quote. And um, this whole concept of outside innovation or open innovation, um, it's obviously, you know, taking taking off. And, you know, it's not just Procter & Gamble. We see companies like Shell, Unilever, Samsung, countless others taking this approach where they're collaborating with external stakeholders, be they customers, partners, uh, members of the general public. And I know in Shell's case, um, they've run a program called Game Changer, and it was through that open innovation program that they uh, tapped into an external uh, resource who came up with a way to um, basically mine for liquefied natural gas at sea. Um, usually they need to undertake that process back on land, um, which meant they could only uh, access and bring back certain uh, limited amounts of gas and also sub made them subject to environmental disasters at land. So it was like a twofold sort of thing where they could access vastly greater uh, reserves of gas, but also do that at sea um, to mitigate any risk of um, environmental disaster. And that was something that they needed to go outside of the building to tap into. Um, And it's had a a massive effect on their business. So definitely important. And I think, um, I mean, I'm also keen to explore this concept of how much of this also comes back to people feeling like they need to be seen to be doing something? Um, like, for example, here in Australia, we've got an independent, or let's say a supposedly independent startup body called Startup Oz, and they recently re- uh, received a sum of about $360,000 from the federal government, which received much outcry in the press. Um, but um, politics aside... They were commissioned to create several reports on the startup ecosystem in Australia, yet the likes of Deloitte, PwC, KPMG, Google, um, and the Startup Genome Project have all released reports on our ecosystem in the past year, which more or less cover the same thing. So it's received a lot of criticism, but this isn't new. I think we see evidence of this across so many different industries where you know, reports will be commissioned, things will be developed. Um, How much of this is a reflection of, I suppose, people in charge being... Um, well, wanting to be seen to be doing something. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And I think that when um, we consider ourselves or others consider us to be subject matter experts mm-hmm. in a particular field, and we're supposed to own that knowledge, that knowledge base, um, you, you see others that um, begin to encroach on what should be your expertise mm-hmm. and that fear of not being the smartest person in the room kicks in and you know you start thinking to yourself gosh well I should have thought of that well I am going to think of that well you really didn't think of it but you're going to come up with an idea that uh, (laughs) definitely does reinvent the wheel um, simply to be able to say yes I thought of that too so I think you're right about that that's that's a kind of a social uh, commentary a a psychological one Um, Mm. so there's two aspects to that non-invented here part of it is Part of it is biological, and part of it, I think, is social psycho- psychological. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think that brings us to a close in terms of the seven different floors, but I was keen to explore a couple of other things, um, namely your New Yorker magazine uh, cartoon caption contest. Um, well, you actually, you mean, you, you consider winning the New York magazine caption contest among your most creative achievements. Can you care to tell us a little bit about that, Matthew? <laughs> uh, sure. Um, the reason I think it's so creative is, uh, or, or I consider it to be more, one of my more creative uh, ventures, is the sheer numbers of uh, people that uh, enter 
uh, captions into the weekly contest that the New Yorker magazine has. Um, mm-hmm. Upwards of 12,000 are fielded. And, and I know this now because they've reached out to previous winners and they engage us in initial screening of, uh, of new captions, uh, sort of crowdsource the, uh, the evaluation process. Mm-hmm. And uh, this was back in 2008, and I decided that I'd try my hand at actually using one of the uh, techniques uh, one of the fixes, if you will, uh, for for fixation, um, which is the notion of synthesizing uh, or satisficing rather, which is the notion of synthesizing uh, parts of different problems and mashing them up into uh, a higher level or more elegant solution. Mm-hmm. And this particular panel uh, was drawn as, you know, all the, the cartoons are single panels, and it was a picture of uh, a couple in a bed wearing uh, hazardous material mm-hmm. suits. Uh, and, you know, boy, you could, you could think of all the obvious or satisficing um, captions related to being in bed or uh, sex or you name it. Um, a lot of obvious ones come to mind. Yep. I used my own technique to, to do word tags of everything that I saw on the panel. Uh, I, I played opposite day on some of them. I riffed on others of them, and I finally settled on a mashup of a couple of different ideas related to protection. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, uh, the, the winning caption was, uh, you know, one person turning to the other saying, next time, can we just get flu shots like everyone else? <laughs> uh, and uh, that, was, that was the winning, winning uh, caption. I have yet to, uh, to win it. Since it's been eight years, uh, I continually try, and then sometimes I get to be a finalist, but I've I've yet to win it. So it's very difficult to do, and it requires, um, uh, you know, a certain skill, I guess, that uh, I can't replicate that well. Mm-hmm. But uh, I sure try. Well, that's a great caption. Um, so I've got three final questions for you, Matthew, and these are three questions that I ask all of my guests, not necessarily about your book, but general questions that I ask about. Lifestyle design and two hypotheticals. So the first one, and this is completely unscripted, um, is if you could work for any company at any stage of their company life cycle, who would it be and why? Oh, gosh. Uh, any company at any stage in their life cycle and why? Um, well, you know, I, I, I got to spend eight years uh, with a company called Toyota, mm-hmm. and I would have loved to have been – uh, at Toyota, uh, when they converted from being a spinning and weaving company to being an automobile company that they started in a little corner in their spinning and weaving loom factory uh, in Japan in the early 1930s. I would have loved to have been to have seen what eventually would uh, would be part and parcel to uh, something that changes the world, which is the, uh, the automobile. Mm. Um, but to do so in, in a situation where uh, the resources are just so very finite and so very tight and followed closely by a world war that devastated everything, I would have yeah. loved to have been uh, involved in, in, because the only resource they really had uh, following World War II um, was human creativity. There was little in the way of land, little in the way of money, little in the way of business prowess or anything, and they just sort of kind of rose from the dust to uh, eventually be a powerhouse, but they did it through little ideas, little ideas invented by people at the front line constantly and continually. I would have loved to have been there for that. Yeah, that's a great, great answer. Um, And you actually wrote a book about Toyota, didn't you? I did. My very first one was was called The Elegant Solution, Toyota's Formula for Mastering Innovation. And while I studied them and worked with them, I would have loved to have been, uh, uh, you know, actually part of that 1930s, 1940s uh, experience. Mm, Great answer. Um, So question number two, Matthew, is if you could ask anybody a question, dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? (laughs) Wow. Tough one. Um, Boy, I don't know if I can uh, I can come up with a really creative uh, uh, solution to that. And any person dead or alive? Any person. Just say the first thing that comes to your mind. It's the kind of question where you may say something now, and then if I was to ask you tomorrow, you'd say something completely different. <laughs> 
Oh, gosh. Okay. I, I'd probably uh, ask Elton John when he first wore those silly glasses, what was he thinking? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. And, and finally, um, a lifestyle design question, Matthew. Obviously, you're into your mindfulness. Um, I like to find out, well, I like to ask all of my guests, um, how do they stay t- on top of their games? Do you have any rituals or routines um, that you know, take up either a part of your day or something you do throughout your day? I do. Um, it is, uh, it's mountain biking. Mm-hmm. Um, it's my way of uh, doing something that's challenging but doesn't require uh, a good bit of mental energy. And I tend to get my best ideas when I'm out in nature, uh, in the dust, in the dirt, um, clear skies, good mm-hmm. weather, on a bicycle, yeah. moving. I tend to get my best, uh, my best thoughts and ideas that way. I actually wrote a, a decent part of this book in my head while uh, while on bike rides. Yeah, I totally relate to that. For me, it tends to be uh, when I'm in the gym or just after a workout, um, I find the mind is way more clear and I come up with all sorts of ideas and I always make sure I have you know, Evernote uh, handy to just make sure I capture those ideas as quickly as possible so they don't... Uh, you know, disappear into some sort of dark abyss. But no, that's great. And I imagine um, in Westlake's village, you've got quite a few uh, hills in that area. Or yeah, I live right at the foot of the Santa Monica Mountains, um, so I've uh, I can just leave out of my uh, back door and and hop on a trail and uh, be in the rocks and dirt in no time. Beautiful, beautiful. So finally, Matthew, where can people go to find out a little bit more about you and pick up a copy of your book? You know, the single source is uh, where you can get to anywhere uh, with respect to learning about me or the book or anything is MatthewEMay.com, M-A-T-T-H-E-W-E-M-A-Y.com. Perfect. Headquarters. Too easy. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on Future Squared, Matthew. You've been an awesome guest, and we will include all of the information relating to the book and your good self in the show notes. So thanks again. That's great. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate it. Well, that's it for my chat with Matthew May. Hope you found that as insightful as I did and that you start to use some of these seven fatal flaws or start to address them at least in your uh, day-to-day and therefore hopefully generate some better outcomes in your personal and professional life. As always, if you're picking up what I'm putting down, I'd love it if you'd take just one minute of your time to show some love by subscribing to and giving this podcast a five-star rating on iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud. It would mean a hell of a lot to me and the team who helped put this together and would also help us to continue bringing you the caliber of guests that we've brought you to date. But before I go, I'd like to remind you of some of the upcoming events we're running at Collective Campus. Next week, I'll be running a free Intro to Blockchain for Bankers class, which you can attend in person or live stream online. Later this month, we're running a mini conference called Disrupt the Public Sector. It's the second time running this conference as part of Innovation Month 2016, and in early September, we'll be hosting a Playing Lean workshop, a fun way to learn the Lean Startup methodology in just three hours. These are just the tip of the iceberg. We've got a ton of classes, workshops, courses, and resources that you can start to tap into both offline and online today. So to find out more, just head to collectivecamp.us. And until next time, Future Squared out.